Hello, everyone. So nice to be here for the Land and Built Environment panel um, in the symposium. Today, we'll be hearing from five very distinguished panelists who are working for environmental justice, um, specifically in areas related to land, water use, um, the built environment, um, but from a variety of different perspectives. So to start off the panel, we'll be hearing from Ivy Jaguzny. Ivy Jaguzny is an 18-year-old climate organizer based in Seattle who is fighting for her generation's right to a livable planet and access to a clean, safe, and healthy environment. She serves as the press lead at Zero Hour, a youth-led movement creating entry points, training, and resources for young organizers wanting to take immediate, systemic, and far-reaching action on climate change. Welcome, Ivy. Hi. Um, so I serve on the communications team of Zero Hour. Um, and first of all, I think it's important to say that for young people, the climate crisis has been an emergency as long as we've been alive. And we've seen leaders make a lot of excuses and break their promises over and over again. Um, Zero Hour was formed in response to this inaction. And just a little bit about the organization. So, and like what we've been doing, um, in 2018, we held the first youth-led climate march um, and lobby day on Capitol Hill and in 25 cities around the world. Um, in 2019, we hosted a youth-led climate summit in Miami, which um, is projected to be underwater soon, where we trained hundreds of youth organizers. And from there, it got pretty big. Um, we built a movement that I think is a force to be reckoned with. Um, right now, we're working with our adult allies to build a policy agenda for the White House. Um, and our, our main slogan, this is zero hour, is a reminder to everyone that our generation's access to natural resources and a safe environment is at risk and we, we don't have any time to waste. Um, for many young people, um, the degradation of land and the damage of climate change is already um, a reality. And I work with a lot of young people around the world who have been really traumatized by pollution and natural disasters. Um, and they, they've lost a lot, they've lost stability, they've lost their homes and their health. And for those young people, it's about, it's about survival. And so our movement is demanding justice for frontline youth around the world who are already being hurt by climate change. And we are also, we are also demanding that our leaders um, and adults with decision-making power, um, treat the climate crisis like the emergency that it is. And so in terms of my role, um, I work with the media. And so a lot of my work involves giving young people platforms to speak out and tell their truths. Um, and I think the one, the thing I really want, I hope that people watching this will take away um, is that we, we're a bunch of teenagers. We don't have a lot of institutional power. We are, I don't know, I think we see the extent of the injustice. It's very clear to us because we're inheriting a planet, but we have no control over what happens to it. And, and I think it's clear to all of us that the recklessness of people in power is the cause of this disaster. And so what, what our main message is, is that, you know, we need systemic changes to solve this crisis. We need things that um, restore our land and uplift local economies and give people access to basic human rights. Um, that's what's gonna solve this crisis. And that's been our message from the beginning. 
And, you know, we are not, we're not lawmakers, we're not experts, we are not company executives, but we need people with power to act like it's a matter of life and death, like it's a matter of livelihood and health, because for a lot of young people, it already is. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. The next panelist is David Mendoza. David is the Director of Advocacy and Engagement for the Washington chapter of the Nature Conservancy, overseeing state and federal lobbying and policy communication staff. Prior to the Nature Conservancy, he served as the Director of Legislative and Government Affairs for Front and Centered, a Washington statewide coalition of organizations rooted in communities of color and people with lower incomes focused on environmental justice. In this role, David helped shape climate policy in Washington state and played a critical role in developing the HEAL Act and served as a co-chair on the state environmental justice task force. Welcome, David. Thank you, Mariel. Uh, I got my, my role here today is to give you folks a sense of what's happening at state government and how's our state government trying to address uh, over, like the, the, con the conditions of overburdened communities surrounded by high levels of pollution and, and toxic sites. And so I, you know, um, the HEAL Act is a central component of this work. Um, and that actually, before we get kind of into details of the HEAL Act, I wanna share a very powerful tool that Front and Center helped develop in cooperation with the Department of Health and University of Washington called the Environmental Health Disparities Map. This is a map you can find on the Department of Health's website right now. And it shows down to the census tract level, 19 different characteristics of a community and what they're facing from diesel emissions and particulate matter to lead risk, to low birth weights, to cardiovascular disease, to housing burden, unemployment, rate and their ethnic and demographic makeup. So this really powerful tool was developed over about three year process of um, you know, really led by front and center. Um, and when I got to front and center, they were nearly done with that process. And I saw just this powerful tool that helps really uh, ex uh, provide information and detail uh, to the whole, uh, whole of the state of what communities are facing. And it creates a scale of one through 10 of what communities are facing. If, if you're a 10 on this map, that means you have the highest levels of health disparities, probably the highest levels of pollution. And this has real impact. It, and, it, and it shows, we have had some further analysis of what the map shows. And it shows that the higher you are on that map from one through 10, the more likely you are to be a person of color. Right, so you're living in overburdened polluted communities. And this has deep impacts on people's lives. If you, the average age in Washington state, average life expectancy is about 80.5 years, one of the highest I think in our country. Um, but if you live in a one, so you live in a very clean part of the state, you're expected to live two years longer than, 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 the, than the average in the state. But if you live in a two, a 10, uh, on the map, you're expected to live almost four years less. So that's what the power, I think, of this tool shows you what communities are facing across the state. So seeing that power and starting my role when I, I got into front and center, I also saw the desire and interest from so many state government agencies to want to say, how, what is environmental justice? How do we address it? What, what, what's going on here? And so there was a need, I think, you know, working with the team, we felt, we felt like the HEAL Act was a way to start addressing that. How, do, how can we center environmental justice in government agencies? Uh, we had our first run of it in 2019 and got really far. Uh, we didn't get all the way there though. But what we did get was the Environmental Justice Task Force. Um, and that was a, over a, about an 18 month process where when we could, I was co-chair of that task force when I represented front and center. And um, what that task force did was good. When we could, we went around the state and listened directly to communities. We had an interactive conversations. It wasn't just your, your two minute uh, public testimony. We had dialogue with staff, with a community who would come and show up. Front and Center itself paid for local community organizations to, to, to convene groups, to learn about the environmental justice task force, to learn about uh, the work that's been happening, to share, and then to share their stories when the official task force came in. So we had this really community-driven process in order to inform the work of that task force. And last fall, we issued 26 different recommendations um, that covered the range of ways we think state government can start beginning to address 
uh, environmental justice in a real way in our state. Um, and it, you know, it's lots of different recommendations and I'll touch on the HELO Act, which gets onto a bunch of them. But some of the things that are also in that bill include, you know, ensuring we have, not in the bill, in the recommendations, is that, you know, all agencies should utilize um, uh, a racial equity toolkit in, in the range of how they address work, both the internal structures and in developing policy, uh, that we need to incorporate environmental justice into a broad range of state laws, that we need to prioritize high labor standards diversity of contracting and work with state funds, and also that we need to study reparations, that the uh, People of color in the state have been uh, discriminated against through things like redlining and, and, and uh, for, for where they can live, buy property, and also business practices, discrimination they have faced in banking, and that the state has an obligation to look into those longstanding forms of discrimination and adjust and make up for those past discriminations and help our, co our communities today succeed. Um, so that recommendation came out in, in uh, fall and the the Front and Center has led the development of the HEAL Act since then. Um, and what the HEAL Act does, what it actually creates a definition of environmental justice in state law. And that definition um, is builds off this federal definition that says, basically you need to engage with impacted communities, bring them to the table. That's where that federal definition stops. What we also need is the next level. So that we've added into our definition, you don't just need to bring folks to the table, you actually need to address the problems they're talking about and you invest equitably you need to repair past harms. So that's the definition we're advocating to put into state law. And further, many agencies to do a few things. One, um, better community engagement. I think the crux and core of, of environmental justice is engaging with those most impacted and learning from them and coming up with solutions collaboratively. And so that's what we recommend every state agency uh, to have a community engagement. Two, it is a bad, uh, the, the vision uh, and goals of environmental justice into their strategic plan so that they're investing moving forward. And the big part of this is that agencies would be directed to apply what we're calling an environmental justice assessment, somewhat like a racial equity toolkit, understanding what are the problems uh, if we wanna do a thing like policy or enforcement or uh, capital project development, building new things, that before you do all that, you need to understand what's happening in the community, what kind of what kind of burdens are they currently living with? How can this help lessen those? How whatever your project is, how can you lessen those or ameliorate those past harms? Um, and so that's what the core of the Heal Act does. All that work would be guided by an environmental justice council consisting of community members in a constant iterative kind of back and forth conversation with agencies as they work and develop these plans. To implement and, forward. and that's the big exciting bill that we're working on. Uh, it's full broad support from communities of color across the state, you know, mainstream environmental organizations like the one I work for today, the Nature Conservancy, um, and a range of other organizations that are really pushing this forward. Um, we've gone a long way uh, this session. We, we've already passed the Senate, working through, expecting to get out of their next uh, House uh, committee and hope to have uh, this bill passed and get it ready for the governor's section, uh, signature by the end of April, beginning in May. Um, a couple other bills that also incorporate really good parts of environmental justice include uh, House Bill 1216, which is about um, urban forestry. And for the Department of Natural Resources, actually a bill we pointed to um, in the Environmental Justice Task Force of how 50% of the resources DNR will devote into um, creating more tree canopy in our communities uh, will be guided by the environmental health disparity map for the, those kind of overburdened communities. I think I'll stop there. I think I've probably talked a little too long already. I'll pass it along. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, we'll have questions for all the panelists in the Q&A um, after their presentations. Um, our next panelist is Liliana Ayala. She is the climate justice, uh, Liliana Ayala is the climate justice director at the city of Seattle's Office of Sustainability and Environment. Prior to joining the city of Seattle, Liliana led climate and environmental policy and outreach for Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Her career has spanned work in restoration ecology, public lands, organizational and leadership development and workforce development at the intersection of youth, racial equity and environment. She led the design and launch of the Ray Marine Conservation Fellowship, 
the first national fellowship program dedicated to increasing representation of people of color in marine conservation. Liliana was a founding organizer of the Seattle chapter of the Environmental Professionals of Color. She is a Henry M. Jackson Leadership Fellow, a longtime volunteer with Seattle-based environmental justice organization, Got Green, and is on the board of Short Rung Comics and Arts Festival. Liliana is a creative partner of The Growing Old Project, a podcast series exploring Seattle's urban forest and the humans that live within it. She has a BA in English from Winona State University, a certificate in nonprofit management from Georgetown University, and a certificate in wetland science and management from the University of Washington. Welcome, Liliana. Thank you so much, Marielle. Um, I have just a couple of slides to, to share, and um, I'm really glad that I did this because it um, provides some nice context to what um, my friends have presented right before me. Um, so uh, as Marielle shared, uh, I work for the city of Seattle. Um, and of course, in these Zoom days, hopefully folks can see my screen. <laughs> if we're playing um, bingo, uh, someone might have that square. Um, so I work for the city of Seattle. I work on climate justice uh, here. Um, my primary role is um, bridging the work of our equity and environment initiative um, and our work of our racial justice um, uh, initiative closer to our climate work um, and embedding those values um, in the policy that we create, um, the outcomes, uh, the way that we develop partnership and do outreach and engagement. Um, so I just wanted to start with um, this photo. Um, I am joining you from uh, the occupied lands of the Duwamish people and the Coast Salish tribes. I live just west of the Duwamish River. Um, and I'm starting with this photo because we're talking about built environment and land today. And if you see the the image on the left, um, that's a photo of the Duwamish River from the mid 1800s. Um, what you see is beautiful bends, probably we'll see lots of nice uh, uh, riffles and pools for, for salmon habitat. Um, we see uh, an estuary there. Um, we see a beautiful forest um, and likely um, uh, based on oral tradition and, and uh, documented data um, through, uh, through the tribes um, and Coast Salish people, um, abundant foods, um, uh, salmon and clams and mussels, um, salmon berries, um, that, that sort of thing. And then you see on the right um, what Seattle looks like today. Um, and you'll notice that our uh, river has been straightened. Um, that's directly linked to policy creation um, around the Clean Water Act, um, which dictates uh, clear, um, clear navigable waters. Um, and then uh, you'll see all of the buildings um, and the, the landscape has changed drastically. Um, so I wanted to make that point. Um, and then you'll see um, and oh, uh, just wanted to shout out if folks were interested in um, learning more about that history. Um, this is a book that BJ Cummings wrote, um, uh, who was uh, the founding executive director of the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition, um, and talks a little bit more about that history. Um, but what I'm bridging to here is um, the linkage between environmental justice um, and housing. So this is a photo of um, the displaced Duwamish people camped um, on Ballast Island in Seattle's harbor. Um, this is around 1900, um, and uh, this is absolutely, uh, you know, the history of colonization is uh, linked with climate justice um, and environmental justice. So um, we talk about things like um, environmental justice is access to clean water, um, housing, um, uh, clean air, um, and uh, these are uh, original stewards of our land who are camped out in tents. Um, and if folks know the history of Ballast Island, um, Ballast Island is an island that was um, created through refuse um, and trash. Um, so this is absolutely uh, an important history to know. It has um, been an important part of what we are seeing and experiencing today in terms of environmental justice um, and um, begins to link uh, housing with um, the, the fight for environmental justice that our communities are have undertaken. 
Um, so I'm gonna skip over here. So David talked about um, redlining um, and racial covenants. These, this is about 24 years later, um, the first racial covenant was drafted in Seattle um, and dictated where um, communities of color could live in the city and where um, white folks could live. Um, I put a link here to a Seattle Times article in case folks are interested in learning more about racial covenants. Um, and this is a historic map here of segregated Seattle. So um, it might be a small image, but you um, it's possible that you might see there's some labels here that say um, still desirable, best, um, uh, hazardous, um, the areas that um, uh, communities of color were relegated to live in were um, in the hazardous category or um, uh, less desirable. Um, I mentioned this because it is through policy um, that um, communities of color and low income communities um, have begun to experience uh, lack of resources, lack of investment, um, folks living in areas um, that um, don't have uh, adequate uh, insulation in their homes. Um, we see things like uh, prevalent mold um, instances uh, uh, linked to that lack of insulation, um, high energy bills. Um, and, and those are absolutely things that are um, environmental justice issues. So I'm gonna go on. So why this matters, um, and this is a question I'm posing to you and feel free to, to answer in the chat here, but what is the most significant predictor of a person living near contaminated air, water, or soil? I'm sure you'll be able to answer this. Yep, it's race. Um, and that's true throughout the United States. Um, so here in Seattle, 58% um, of our population lives within a mile of the Superfund boundary um, that, that are people of color. Um, and then 13 of the 14 heaviest industrial polluters are within um, uh, that Duwamish Valley. So uh, going back to that, that photo that I showed you in the beginning of the presentation, um, all the while, while that landscape shifted, people were living there, people continue, continue to live there and we're seeing um, higher instances of asthma rates um, in, in those neighborhoods neighborhoods, um, as well as um, lower life expectancies as compared to um, neighborhoods like Laurelhurst or Magnolia, if you're, if you're familiar with Seattle. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to cruise along here and talk a little bit about buildings. So um, that history is incredibly important for us at the City of Seattle, at the Office of Sustainability and Environment, and for many of you out there that are working on environmental justice issues. Um, the uh, primary sources of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from our building sector uh, and from transportation. So that what that means is that um, the um, use of fossil fuels um, are um, impacting our health in so many different ways um, related to asthma. If you have a gas stove um, and you don't have um, a heat to deal with the the exhaust, you're breathing in toxics, um, and a lot of folks don't know that. Um, and so uh, at the city, we're um, trying to do a couple things. One, uh, address our impact on on climate climate change um, through policy, but we also understand that we have to make deep investments in communities who have historically been impacted um, by, by the effects of those racist policies and inequitable policies. Um, and so um, many of the policies that are listed here, like our electrification of existing buildings, our clean heat program, um, and Seattle Energy Code um, uh, considers those things, incorporates um, uh, an equity-based um, uh, a solution um, in, in this. So I'll speak specifically, uh, for example, for our clean heat program. Um, this is a program that puts a tax on oil heat. Um, and oil heat is quite expensive. If you've ever had that in your home, I, I rented a house with oil heat. Um, and um, my husband and I turned it on maybe once uh, a year uh, to try to, to um, warm up the house. But um, it was really, really expensive for us. We couldn't afford to, to have it. So we would have electric heaters um, turned on. Um, the city's program um, to transition folks from oil heat pays for 100% of the transition for homes that are 80% AMI or less um, uh, so that 
the cost um, or the burden of that compliance isn't on low income communities. Um, so that's just one example of how we're thinking about incorporating equitable solutions. Um, and then I also just wanted to lift up community wisdom in this. Um, so uh, the city of Seattle, we have a lot of amazing folks that are dedicated to policy. Um, we do our own data and research, but what is really, really important to us is understanding um, the data from our communities. Those who are closest to the problem know the solutions more intimately. Um, and so we, tr we take direction from our communities. This is one source of research that um, is incredible. We have referenced throughout 2020 frequently and we're continuing to reference the data that's that shows up in um, powering the transition um, and this was developed and put out by Puget Sound Sage um, here in in the city of Seattle um, and I just wanted to highlight one thing in terms of homes and affordable housing um, as an environmental justice issue um, Sage posted a question here posed a question to um, the folks that they interviewed around um, if your energy costs went up by fifty dollars which of the following you, you are more likely to do um, what is really disheartening is that folks are faced with really difficult decisions around, do I pay my utility bill or do I pay my rent or do I pay my mortgage? Do I buy food or pay for important medicines um, for my family or uh, pay for childcare and elder care? So these are um, unfair uh, decisions that are being posed um, to, to our communities of color and low-income communities. Um, and um, this is something that this image sticks with me frequently um, when I'm thinking about policy. Um, folks shouldn't have to make those kinds of sacrifices um, in order to live comfortably and have shelter. Um, and then I just wanted to mention um, at, at um, in terms of the, my programs, uh, some of the priorities we have are deepening our partnership with our communities, um, co-developing solutions um, and in the spirit of shared power and um, wealth redistribution, um, and then investing in community-led climate and environmental work along with equitable policy creation. So um, I'll uh, wrap up there, but just wanna thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Liliana, for that presentation. Our next speaker, our next panelist is Ubaldo Hernandez. Ubaldo works as a senior organizer, conducting community outreach on clean water while promoting equity, inclusion, and diversity. Ubaldo has been an active member in the Latino community in the Columbia Gorge, participating in projects that promote awareness on issues that are relevant to Latinos in Oregon and Washington. In the last 15 years, he has dedicated his free time to launch, launching and participating in multiple projects benefiting the Latino community, including the local community radio station Radio Tierra and the newly Latina Latino-led environmental and social justice organization Comunidades. In his free time, he enjoys mountain biking, fishing, and hiking in the Columbia Gorge. Welcome, Ubaldo. Bienvenidos. Gracias. Uh, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, speak and try to uh, talk about um, uh, the needs our, of our Latino, Latina uh, community that uh, we have to go through in order to uh, access uh, environmental and social justice. Um, living in the uh, Gorge community, in Washington and Oregon for the last 26 years, I've been experiencing and seeing how uh, the fight for uh, protecting our environment, environmental justice, uh, uh, environmental justice goes hand by hand with social justice for our Latino community or for people of colors uh, that we have to deal with. Uh, one of the things that we uh, talk in our group and uh, Columbia River Keeper and Comunidades is that we are always seen as a part of the Latino community wanting to advocate for environmental justice, but we always ended up seeing the social injustice that happen every time, every time an environmental uh, injustice happen. So one of the things that we see the most 
in our communities is uh, housing. It's a big problem for our communities. And we just had a crisis in which uh, 25 families that they were displaced in White Salmon, Washington from a trailer park uh, where they were able to afford rent uh, and the landlord decide to uh, evict all these uh, families living there and um, and give them a year to move and they have to uh, uh, pay the expenses of removing their trailers from the site, which we see this is a, a social justice issue, right? Because we see people living having the, the, to leave their places where they've been living sometimes, some families for uh, over 25 years, where they have their kids there, they go to school in the area, and they are being asked to leave there because the owner decide to move their places. And one of the things that we see on these type of issues is that it's not just the social impact that happened to the Latino community, but also there is an environmental impact that happened at the same time. And that's what we always talk about. We cannot talk about environmental injustices without talking about social injustice. Uh, what happened in this community, uh, I just, I want to describe a little bit more what happened so people understand all these problems that the community needs to go through is that these families that have been displaced from this area, they are pushed to move outside of the area which that increase the cost of moving from one side to another one. Like uh, a lot of those families that they were living in this place, they were working, uh, I think three, four miles from the packing house that they were working. And now they're moving to places where they have to travel up to 20 uh, minutes, or I say from 20 to 40 minutes, one way to get to work. That means that increase the uh, time they have to be on the car, pollution. Also, when they have these, they remove these uh, places where they have affordable housing, they create places where they build houses, they are more expensive, they are bigger, and they reduce the, um, the number of families that can live there. That means they uh, reduce the uh, number of um, families that benefit from having affordable housing, they uh, push these 25 families to live close to uh, um, a small community, close to the forest. Uh, and, uh, and that is another thing that we see that these families, they have to move to these areas where they have to um, occupy at places where they were not supposed to be um, having too many people living. I mean, it's an uh, environmental impact on this side, um, but also it goes into the, um, uh, we see these families that they were uh, moved from these areas to, uh, to have a lot of problems with their uh, families that they were uh, torn apart because of these decisions. So one of the things that we uh, want to uh, make sure is that these type of actions do not happen again, because uh, when there is a lack of um, uh, uh, affordable housing in the area, you have to displace families that have been living in these communities for a long time to travel farther and create more pollution when these things happen. Um, the other thing is our communities, they want to participate in advocating for our natural resources. And there is not a way the community can have access to this information. Um, a lot of times people think that translating from English to Spanish, when there is translation, which is not always the case, translating just word by word doesn't mean much for our communities. So they need, there is a need for a proper cultural translation so our communities can feel connected with these issues and participate to uh, protect and preserve our natural resources. 
So one of the things that we also see in our communities is the big need for a public transportation. Our small communities, we don't have public transportation. And this is one of the biggest problems because everybody in these communities, they need to have cars. They use a lot of um, gas, they have a lot more pollution. And I think there is always solutions for proper and, uh, and public transportation for the small communities. Thank you, Ovaldo, for discussing so many different um, issues related to land use um, and how it impacts water and air. Our final panelist is Jonalee Squiox. Jonalee Squiox is the environmental coordinator with Yakima Nation Fisheries, based in Topenish, Washington. She is also actively involved in developing the Yakima Nation's climate change efforts, serving as the Climate Action Plan Project Coordinator. Her work is primarily focused on habitat restoration efforts throughout the Yakima and Columbia basins on behalf of the Yakima Nation. As an enrolled member of the Yakima Nation, she strives to speak for those resources that cannot speak for themselves. Welcome, Jonalee. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you all this up today. And uh, I just have a couple short slides so we can get to some questions here pretty soon. Shared. Okay, can you guys see the screen all right? Great. Get this started. So it's always a little tricky on um, speaking for tribes <laughs> on behalf of tribes because there's 29 tribes in the state. So I can't really speak for all of us as for one unified voice. So I'm just going to speak for our tribe and uh, try to give a little history and background on where we come from and what we're experiencing and where we're going in the future and what we're moving towards. So the Yakima Nation is comprised of 14 tribes and bands from the plateaus of central Washington. Um, our traditional territory stretched from Canada to California to Montana, but the 14 tribes when we signed our treaty in 1855, those were the, the 14 tribes that um, made up our, our tribal entity. Like I said, we are a sovereign entity, sovereign tribal entity within the United States, and we are one of 29 federally recognized, tribe, recognized tribes in Washington state. Currently, we have about 12,000, um, probably more than that, enrolled members, uh, enrolled tribal members. And our tribal government consists of a tribal council with 14 elected, elected members, and that's basically a business council. So they dictate our policy and uh, conduct the business for the tribe, and that filters down to our tribal programs. We also have four general council officers that represent our general membership, and they have yearly meetings to discuss our important business matters, um, our important um, social matters. And so a lot of times our programs present pro, um, to our general council and we end up having discussions about things like environmental justice and climate change. This is just a, a breakdown of where our lands, our important lands are um, the, for us. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a screenshot of central Washington. And if you can see the purple outline, that's our areas of usual and custom areas, territories. So those are lands that we're allowed to go gather and, and hunt and, and conduct our cultural and spiritual practices. The little blue outline, it's kind of difficult to see on the color map, but if you look at the white map of Washington, that blue outline is our reservation boundary. And so that's in South Central Washington. It's about 1.3 million acres and it includes several municipalities. Um, it's home to, we're smack dab in the middle of the Acoma Valley. So it's very, deep into agriculture. We have various agricultural land uses, as well as a forest area because we're at the foothills of Mount Adams and we have uh, semi-arid rangelands also. Our ceded territory is about 11 million acres throughout central Washington. So the Acme Nation is primarily land-based. Uh, we are not a coastal tribe where we live and we're placed here uh, in the plateau area. So. We rely heavily on 
access to water from the Yakima River and the Columbia River Basin for survival. Um, a lot of what was spoken about previously about being placed places based on race, that's very much applicable to us. Um, we were kind of put out in the middle of sagebrush until they figured out this land was irrigatable and boom, we ended up with a bunch of ag practices in the middle of our reservation. Um, <clears throat> so for us, uh, a lot of it base, a lot of our impacts are related uh, very closely to the water access um, on the reservation. Uh, that translates really closely to our culturally significant resources, our medicines and our foods. And access for us is what uh, probably the biggest issue that we have um, for environmental justice is, is be having access to what clean, cold water. Um, we use that. That's the first thing on, when we set our tables for our feasts. That's our, our first our first resource. Um, it's something we rely on heavily for our cultural identity. So having act, water quality and water quantity. Two, two of the biggest issues that we have um, as far as our, our folks, our, our tribal folks are concerned. We have a issue with soil erosion, both um, from agricultural practices through water runoff. And that also ties into kind of Ubaldo's um, line of work with the, we have a lot of farm workers that are also um, on the reservation proper. So we end up with a lot of pesticide issues, herbicide issues, and we have all of these contaminants floating down to the Yakima River. Um, we have contamination along canals, um, but it, we also have a lot of air erosion now. So we've had some fires come through and we've had um, a lot of areas that the, the soils are unstable now. So, and also unstable are our weather patterns. And so that's something that we've been noticing. It's, it's impacting the availability of our foods and it's also uh, impacting when our foods show up. So now that it's springtime, our foods are starting to come back um, and, and greet us again. So <clears throat> what we're ending up with are our, our first foods showing up months ahead or our salmon showing up months later or you know we're we're not able to, to properly keep our calendar, and so that's something that our, our 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 gatherers and our hunters and fishermen have been noticing that the impact just based on climate change <clears throat> and also access to uh, these places because there's sometimes there's a gate with a padlock on it, and we can't get to these places anymore. So that's that's one of the things that we've um, been kind of showing up with, <laughs> uh, but also um, it's just increased land use and development. And that's where those padlocks are kind of coming in. We've got areas um, outside of Goldendale now where we used to ha gather that um, we no longer have access to. And that's something we've been fighting for centuries is access to those areas. So uh, it's kind of the same story still happening. And, and it's something that we're still working with. Uh, but the noticeable, notable impact kind of major players that uh, I work with and my coworkers work with are the big ones, the Hanford Nuclear Reservation and clean up on that. That's right on our back door, basically. So just right down the road, it impacts our um, fisheries and, and several um, gathering sites uh, traditional gathering sites for not only us, but the, also the Umatilla tribal um, people out of um, Oregon down by Pendleton. So that's a big impact for us. Um, the Columbia River Fish Consumption Advisories is also a big one for us. That's, um, you know, that, that's, some, that's a major part of our cultural activity is going to fish. And so we've been studying for decades now um, with the state and the feds and, and the various entities throughout the Northwest of how bad are our fish tissues? What are we accumulating when we eat those fish tissues? And most of the Columbia River for our fishery in zone six of the fishery there is under an advisory. Um, the resident fish are pretty toxic to eat <laughs> and our salmon are, are most, a, 
a wide variety of our salmon species are also harboring those toxic um, entities, the heavy metals, PCBs, all sorts of kind of nasty stuff. Um, climate change is exacerbating these issues and making them a much more problematic and worrisome. Our tribal leadership just passed our climate action plan. So we're hoping that this will help us get some um, traction on some of these issues. A lot of the, the habitat work that we've been doing, it gives a, a little more structure and, and sturdiness to how we go about developing habitat projects in the future um, and how we go about um, just our general daily life as tribal, tribal people. Uh, one of the big things that we've been doing to Natalie, before and, you, I just wanted to um, kind of let you know that we're eating a little into the Q&A time. Oh, um, okay. So I wanted to ask that as you wrap up your remarks and please and please um, do continue that you also speak to because I'm hearing um, a lot about um, the important um, kind of pro programs that you take on to try to not only understand um, the extent of the problem, but to take it on and that fight that you are working on. So I think a lot of people might want to hear um, kind of a yeah. about how we can support that fight. Um, be, if, if we were just wanting to kind of wrap it up, but it, we collaborate with a lot of different entities and groups. We work with everybody from the feds in the state, all the way down to local working groups. Um, a lot of, if, if there's chances for where you can volunteer uh, in your local, like a lot of local communities, especially like Cleelum and Roslyn. Um, I know White Salmon and a lot of those areas along the, the Columbia River they have active groups and if you can get um, some time to volunteer with them they do it, it, it can even just be cleanup stuff um, that's you know it, there's a lot of stuff with our tribal fisheries program we when we're allowed to go out and interact with the public uh, we do a lot of community projects um, where we have salmon days or you know we try to educate folks on on what to look for um, if, if you see a problem, um, what not to do, like building little dams and stuff in the river for so, to create swimming pools or little swimming holes is really detrimental. So uh, just that social impact of, of getting out there and just asking questions. That's the, the biggest part is if um, you can get out and ask a question and, and be part of a group to collaborate with folks. Um, I know our tribe We've really been working from Wenatchee to the mouth of the Columbia, really, to, to be out there and be an active co-manager, be an active participant um, in the policy direction that um, we're working towards. Uh, the One of the big things that I think, um, if folks have time, is to go look at the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan. That, for us, has been kind of the hallmark for central, our Central Washington collaborative efforts. So uh, that's that's one of the big ones. If you have chan a chance, um, I, this is our website. Uh, our climate change plan will be, be. I'm working to get that on there hopefully by the end of this week. So uh, it literally just got passed a couple of days ago. So <laughs> it'll be on shortly. But um, that's uh, my contact info. If you have any questions, and our fisheries website and our Yakima Nation website. So if you guys have any uh, questions for that. Um, reach out, give me a, give me a call. Give, so. I think we all love your suggestion of asking questions. Um, and that's a really important part of um, just digging into these issues deeper, but also building, um, building connections and also challenging some of the institutions and the power structures that have upheld um, disparities that lead us to kind of need this environmental justice movement. Um, so in light of that, I did want to ask um, panelist Ivy uh, to speak a if you could take just 30, 30 seconds or a minute um, and talk about uh, any suggestions you have for um, activists uh, and those who are who want to take on actions but aren't necessarily people in power or with power or they don't see themselves that way and how they can I ask the right questions in to the right people or whatever um, whatever you recommend um, to to support environmental justice. Um. Okay, since a lot of the work I do is with media and like messaging, I think allowing people that are most impacted by climate change and allowing especially youth and frontline youth to speak their truths and talk about their experiences um, 
and I guess making asking questions that is like I think a really that's good advice and making space for people to talk about the ways that they've been impacted by environmental injustice and um I would also say I don't think there's like one or even a couple right ways to take action I think there's you know I think people have different capacity of what they can take on based on you know like their own circumstances and I think like you know no matter what you're doing as long as you're um I guess in it for the right reasons I hope that's I hope that it was okay, okay answer I don't know well, thanks thank you Ivy uh, we did have a question that came up in the Q&A for David um, how does the HEAL Act consider different indicators of environmental health that are not reflected in the map? Um, for example, for tribes and indigenous peoples who experience environmental injustice as a result of declining salmon and shellfish. Yeah, the just the point of clarity, I, the, the HEAL Act doesn't mandate the use of the map as the only tool for environmental justice assessment. It is, it's a powerful tool, but it is a limited tool. And those are two examples of things that don't show up in that map. So what it, uh, I think an environmental justice assessment would, um, when those kind of issues are relevant to the, the action being taken by, the, by a different government agency, would incorporate those kind of perspectives, utilizing kind of those, those relevant data points in turn, determining the best way to move forward on a given policy project, what have you. Well, thanks for um, clarifying that point, David. And um, Liliana, um, Bouncing off of that, I'm thinking about how assessments and analyses inform um, decision making at the city of Seattle um, and in some of the other um, entities and groups that you uh, are affiliated with um, to really understand what um, not only kind of the scope of, of the issues, but um, where action can be taken. Um, and you spoke a lot about community voices as well. So I was um, wondering what is, um, kind of what is the link between doing kind of the proper data assessment um, to capture that snapshot of the issue and connecting with communities? And how do, how do communities know that they are being engaged with um, kind of appropriately to inform um, strategy at the city level, but make sure that um, there's also kind of learning um, done in that exchange? Ooh, that's a meaty one, Mariel. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, I, I think something that, that's concrete that's coming to mind for me uh, is um, some work that my team is doing around developing key climate indicators. Um, we measure greenhouse gas emissions, but that has a lag. Um, it happens every two years. It doesn't give you real-time data um, and uh, the impact is nuanced. And so uh, the, the team is having conversations with um, a myriad of different researchers and data analysts, but uh, a part of the engagement is having conversations with community and um, shaping those those conversations around, um, you know, wanting to understand what kind of data is most useful for you, um, and how how do your communities experience climate change, um, and uh, trying to overlay um, some of the amazing uh, information that exists in the Washington State Health Disparities Map um, with some work that our colleagues are doing at the planning Office of Planning and Community Development around uh, displacement indicators um, and trying to weave and interweave um, these stories together um, in a way that's dynamic. Um, and so I think there's another layer to this around the stories themselves. Um, and so the, the end product of these conversations and of identifying these indicators would be a public facing dashboard um, that folks can access to pull data to help support you in advocacy, organizing, um, policy creation on a, on a very local level. Um, and so we envision a, an aspect of story. So if we're doing our job right, the stories will shift over time um, in terms of uh, their, the impacts of climate change to, to our community. So um, I think there's there's more there there, but um, that's kind of, I just wanted to give one brief example. Um, and I think if communities know if they're being engaged properly, um, uh, I think 
you know, they'll see people come back to them to report back on the work, not um, have a one and done conversation. Um, there will be follow up, there will be relationship building. Um, you'll see us at your community events, um, cheering you on, um, that sort of thing. So that's one indicator. Thank you, Liliana, and all of the panelists. We have to wrap up, um, and we really appreciate your remarks. There was um, a lot of good information shared, um, and look forward to hearing more throughout the end of the symposium.